Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we can't no value the haters. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. So, every day. Okay, we got uh, another special guest today, possibly the greatest voice in the game. I mean, you'll hear it here in a second. Sebastian uh, Gorka is a British-born Hungarian-American media personality not related to George Soros, military and intelligence (laughs) analyst. (laughs) That's the first time anybody's done. That's good. That's good. (laughs) And former former government official who served in the administration of U.S. President Donald Trump as a deputy assistant to President from January 2017 till August 25th, 2017. He's got a book out, not the one Adam talked about, but the latest one that's out here, The War for America's Soul. Uh, if you haven't uh, followed him on social, his shirt game is on fire. He wears this unique shirt. He's a big fan of the FBI, the uh, Fascist Bureau Intimidation. And he's got a lot to say about it. So having said that, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. But when are you going to fire the guy who does the thumbnail? Let's talk about him. This is a serious issue. You're you're a handsome dude. (laughs) And the thumbnail for you and me today is 40 pounds ago for me. And you look ugly. Who is this guy? Listen, this guy. Who is this guy? Just a Bring him in here now. Let's arm wrestle. And I'm going to crush him. He's (laughs) not a fan. Now. He's not a fan of this podcast. Does he hate America? Uh, Maybe. Maybe, maybe parts of America. Maybe he should go yeah. work somewhere else. I, I, I think afterwards we should have a conversation with Let's him. Let's do How that. How about we do that? Let's, Let's do talk that. to him We're afterwards. trying to create jobs here, not... Uh, By the way, I'm jobs. actually Jeez. curious who did the thumbnail. Can somebody text me and it tell is, me who actually the, did the thumbnail? This is the crappiest thumbnail. <laughs> okay. In, and, and you guys asked my team for, you know, links... Headshots, Rob. bio, and like, oh, screw it's that. Over, screw that. It's over. It's hey, over. It is over. Okay, listen, whoever did it, t-shirt. text there's, me. There's, we got to give him recognition. And, uh, Rob, if you can put the thumbnail up, because it seems like, like Sebastian to, I, really oh, wants oh, to see the picture I again. Just it. put yeah, it up. I got it. I got it. Here, I'd like to see this. Uh, is there a way match. to show it or no? Can you go back? Like, go back to, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what you got to do. Right there. Zoom in a little bit. That's a handsome looking man right there. That's 42 pounds ago. <laughs> 42 <laughs> pounds ago. That's when I was 260, okay? Well, and Sebastian, you're a pretty listen. big dude. How tall are you? 6'3". Yeah, I mean, yeah. Tom looks like a little elf next to you right now. Adam. What? Touch, touch it. it. Just to- <laughs> All right, Just sounds it. good. Well, listen, let's get right into it, guys. We got a lot okay. of things to cover. There's okay. a lot of craziness going on. Uh, we got uh, a few topics that I want to speak to you about. One is Casey DeSantis. A lot of stories that's coming up about Casey DeSantis. One is from New York Post. I'm sure you've read them. A uh, few things on uh, um, Biden's low rating on economy, on immigration. Uh, some say he has the lowest uh, rating as a president since Adam and Eve. It's a long time to, to have oh. something like that. A uh, longtime Democrat, former presidential candidate, makes return to politics to run RFK's campaign. And oust Biden. I want to know your thoughts on yeah. that. Durham report, Jim Jordan urges Congress to use power of the purse against FBI. Obviously, the other side's not doing anything about it. We'll talk reparations, ban on Micron. Uh, China escalates microchip clash with U.S. Maybe we can talk about what's happened with Fox after Tucker. Sure. Uh, we'll talk about the annual meeting attended by the world's elite. Uh, has AI top of the agenda. They don't even hide it anymore. They tell you what meeting it's about. We'll talk about China and Taiwan. Um, I, I, I'm really curious to know if you do drink Bud Light, so we'll talk about a Wall Street Journal story, how Bud Light blew it, and a few other things. But before we get into this, if you don't mind, for the audience that may not know your background, how you got to where you are today, if you don't mind taking a minute sharing your background, that'd be great. Sure, it's, it's hard to do in a minute, but my, uh, my father was an anti-communist who uh, created a secret students organization in Hungary after... The communists took over. He was betrayed by somebody called Kim Philby, a British double agent. He was arrested, tortured, and given a life sentence at the age of 20. He was two years in solitary, two years down a prison coal mine, and eventually liberated by the revolutionaries in 1956. He escaped to the West, literally across a minefield, with the 17-year-old daughter of a fellow political prisoner who became his wife and my mother. I was raised in the UK to Hungarian parents. I spoke Hungarian as a first language. And then after the wall fell, I went to work in the uh, new 
uh, Hungarian government, the first freely elected Hungarian government after communism. I worked in the defense industry, uh, in the defense ministry, um, helping them get into NATO because I'd served in the British reserves in a military intelligence unit. So I was helping them get back into the West. Did uh, lived in Hungary for 15 years, met my beautiful uh, American wife in Europe. And then 9-11 hits, and an amazing man, a Marine who is a legend, one of the greatest men I've ever known, uh, Nick Pratt, Colonel Nick Pratt, a former CIA paramilitary, invited me to teach on a counterterrorism program out of garmisch partenkirchen We have a, a, a U.S. base in Germany, and I was teaching a counterterrorism course for four years to our allies and our partners. And then... Um, Woke up one morning with my wife, 2008. We literally looked at each other in bed. We woke up and we said, time to go. Communism screwed this country. It's going to take another 50 years. Um, I applied for three jobs in the U.S., VMI, West Point, and National Defense University. Got a job at NDU, uh, teaching counterterrorism to 05s, 06s, and uh, one stars. And then I wrote a book called Defeating Jihad, and somebody called Corey, Corey Lewandowski rang me up in the summer of 15 and said, hey, uh, Mr. Trump would like to meet with you to get some prep for the GOP debates on national security. I said, uh, OK. So I <laughs> went to Trump Tower, sat down with then Mr. Trump for about 40 minutes. Unbelievable discussion from the Civil War to nuclear weapons to ISIS to you name it. And then classic Trump move. There's only three of us in the room. He looked at Corey in the corner. And he said... I like this guy. Let's hire him. So uh, I became, I signed an NDA like Stormy Daniels, me and Stormy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and then uh, I started writing him policy papers for the debates. And then I ended up in the White House as his deputy. Served there for seven years, seven months. Felt like seven years. Um, and then uh, resigned because of certain things we can discuss later. And now I have a national radio show with Salem, America First, and a TV show on uh, Newsmax called The Gorka Reality Check. And I'm loving it. I love it. So uh, the 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 2008 when you woke up, you and your wife, you're like, we gotta we gotta get out of yeah. here. What what was the tipping point for you? You know what for me for me it was one concrete thing. So our, our kids uh, were uh, in 2008 were nine and and uh, seven, and they spent every summer in the U.S. because mm -hmm. of my wife's family. So they were socialized as Americans. I remember one day they went to the little Catholic. Uh, school in the village where we lived, about half an hour outside of Budapest. And one day I was watching the playground and I saw this sea of, of gray kids with their heads down and not engaging. And I see two kids standing upright, looking people in the eye. And I thought, wow, our, our kids are different. <laughs> and, and I realized there's a, there's a saying that is maybe apocryphal. that's attributed to uh, Janos Kadar, who was the creator of goulash communism, the softer kind of communism after Stalin died. And apparently somebody asked him in the Politburo, why, why are you doing these reforms? Why, why are you slightly loosening the grip on the people in, in, in communist Hungary? And Kardar said, allegedly, I find it much easier to bend the spine slowly over time than to try and break it suddenly. So this form of, of you know, watered down communism had so seeped into the blood that in 2008, I could still see it in the kids and mm. the 10 year olds and the nine year olds. And I said, I've done my, I've done 15, I'm in the land of my forefathers. I have done 15 years. I've investigated the prime minister for being a secret police officer. I've had death threats on my family. I want to live in a country that I respect. And I'd been working with the US military for about four years. And I said, I love these guys. I want to work for them in America and become an American. So that's why. So last night, <clears throat> the Lakers are playing the Denver Nuggets and they were swept. And after halftime, it's about 1030 or something like that. I said, I'm going to watch the Soros documentary because I had nothing better to do. And so it was... Uh, uh, I thought you'd be having cigars. I was wondering which cigar bar we, I could find we you. We can in. take you there right after this. But <laughs> so, so we're so we're sitting there and, and and I'm watching the documentary. This is the 2019 one. I don't know if you've seen it or which, not. Which go ahead. You go ahead if you want to yeah. pull it up. This is the one that came out in 2019. Okay. Uh, if you've not seen it, I think it's worth watching. Now here's the part. When I watched it, the documentary starts off saying you know everything about him, how people in uh, Hungary 
see him as the devil and all this other stuff. And he is this and he is that. And we don't want him here and we don't want him there. And, you know, all these other countries he can't go into. I think he can't go into the Czech Republic. I think it was Poland. Uh, I think it was Slovenia and one other country that he couldn't go into. And uh, and then the documentary ends selling him as this savior and, you know, how I became oh, really? this. And it's a very interesting documentary. I think you being from where you are, you ought to watch it. So yeah. I'm I'm very interested in this guy because uh, he's, his legacy is not going to go away. His son is going to take over and his son is going to do uh, things. And do but, it, but, but his son is not his father. His son is not smart. He's not like his dad. The legacy is not, and billions of dollars. You come out to 38 year old. Yeah. He's not like his dad. No. So, 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 but this is the question I got for you. As a man that's, you know, from there and you live there, how do they view George Soros? You know, because in this country, in America, the left, this is their God. This is yeah. their guy. This is the guy behind closed doors that's making all the decisions, giving money to an open society organization, all these things. Right. ESG, DEI, CI. But, but how does Hungary view him? And how do you view him? You know, the, the average plumber probably doesn't, doesn't have any idea. Um, the administration, I worked for Orban in the 1990s. We can discuss him separately. Uh, Orban has very effectually communicated in the, the media this, that this guy is anti-West. He's bad. He's bad for Hungary. So if you've heard of him, you think he's a bad guy. In Hungary. In, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, kicking out the central university from, from top Budapest. down. Is it no, from no, top no, down? Or? No, no. I think the mass of people okay, like I who, got you. who, yeah. who, right? But but if you live in the big cities, if you follow politics, right. uh, if you're not, you know, they've destroyed, Orban has very effectively dis destroyed the left in, in Hungary. There's the, the, there, there isn't really much of an opposition left. He had a two thirds majority uh, of, of uh, the parliament. He managed to change the constitution, bring back Christianity and all kinds of great things. So, so the majority of people, if they know of him, if they know of him, know that he's a bad guy. Because Orban has been very good in his, uh, let's just say, information operations. Got it. So, but why is he a bad guy? Why? Well, because, he, because he hates what the West is. I mean, he took Karl Popper's concept of open society when he studied under Popper in yes. the UK. And, and he completely perverted it into, I will decide what is good. I will pick, you know, it's, it, it's like, um, you know, Gnosticism, right? The, the heresy. You know, we have the secret knowledge. It's a little bit like the, the, the bad version of Straussian politics. The, the, a very small coterie of individuals know what is good for everyone. And we will decide. And we will pick. I mean, it's like, it's what, you know, it's like the 70 prosecutors in America. What has he done here? He doesn't have to win presidential elections. Where's the real power in America? It's local. It's when you can put a million dollars into Alvin Bragg's race in New York, a man who campaigned on, I'm going to put Donald Trump in prison. That's power. When you put dozens and dozens of your prosecutors who are radicals who hate America into power to put criminals back on the streets to say, you know, we need, we need, uh, Equity, not equality. That, that, that moment from, what was it, the Bill Maher interview with uh, Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders. Bernie, I, I, don't, what? I don't know the difference. What's the difference? Uh, 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 so, uh, tell me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. excuse, what? You're, yeah. you're Bernie You don't know the difference, Bernie? Well, guess what? George Soros knows the difference, and he is building equity by destroying people in America. Why, though? Why? What? Why does he want to do that? So, so what I wanted to get into this, guys, to see what. Well, look, look, look. Have you seen the interview that they deep sixed of, of him on CBS or ABC when they asked him about what you did during the war? I think that a lot of that is why. I mean, you got to understand, this is a Jewish kid. Can you find this. I mean, th if you if you find it in ten minutes, I'm going to be impressed. Okay, he's asked on camera about what he did during World War II in Hungary as a 15 year old and how he worked with the Nazis to collect the wealth of the Jews, of his fellow Jews, to collect the wealth before they were sent to the labor camps and the death camps. And the interviewer says, do you feel any remorse for this? And he actually laughs. The guy laughs. I saw that. Six million people killed, and you're part of the initial phase? of rounding them up by collecting their wealth before they get put on the cattle carts, and you laugh, dude, if you're trying to deal with that, if your conscience is, is eating you up for the last 60 years, that you helped the Nazis and you're a Jew, there's all kinds of things you could do. Is this do. the one you're talking about? Uh, it looks like it, yeah. All right, you, you got you an Oliva from me, nicely done. <laughs> My understanding is, is that you went out with this protector of yours who swore that you were uh, his adopted godson. Yes, yes. 
went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property from the Jews. That's right. Yes. I mean, that's, that sounds uh, like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Uh, not, not, not at all. Not at all. Look at, uh, look at his face. Maybe as a child, you don't, He's you don't see the connection. Uh, uh, but it was, it created no, no problem at all. No feeling of guilt. No. You're better than the guy Joe Rogan uses. You're quicker. <laughs> <laughs> You're quicker. So, so. I mean, uh, that that. Could you imagine yeah. doing that as as, as a, what what you're a Syrian Christian? A right? Syrian Christian. I, yeah. Imagine you're helping as a 14 year old persecute the Syrian Christians. Yeah. So I'm really trying to figure out his motive, though. Like, what is the motive? Look, though? I, I, as a globalist, I get it. So uh, look, here, let, let, I can't get inside his head. I do not want to go to that, you know, Dante and sixth circle of hell. But what's the motive for the left today? We, we were discussing this before we went live. Forget party politics. Forget, you know, R&D. Uh, I realized this a long time ago. This nation is separated by one question. Do you love America or is America the problem? It's that simple. Uh, uh, is America bad or is it great? He and everybody else who works with him at the Open Society Foundation and works for Alvin Bragg believes America is the problem. And also they have white guilt. Even if you're not Jewish, you have white guilt. How, how does BLM stop you know, getting you know, five different mansions for its founder if not white guilt? The problem in America is, is racism. You know what the problem? It is racism. But who's, who are the racists? The white liberals, those are the people who are the problem in America because they hate themselves and they hate this country. If you think America is the problem, it explains everything. Open borders, right? It explains, you know, why we're doing deals with Iran. It explains everything. It is hatred of America that is the key question. Do you love it or do you hate it? What's the antonym of George Soros? We don't have one. We, you discussed this yesterday. I want to know from you because you're in this yeah. world. Yeah, we, well, well, we had Sh uh, Sheldon Adelson who, who passed last year. Um, that, that this is the big, big problem on the right is that we have people with money who spend it on garbage. I mean, seriously, another full page ad in the Washington Times. That's not gonna, <laughs> that's not gonna move the needle anywhere. We have not been playing the culture war. We haven't. Fought. Look, look at the, look at what is being done in the mainstream media. The, oh, the only guy who could be is Elon, but he's not a conservative. I was on a, a, an hour and a half Twitter spaces with him, and I got to ask him a question, and I listened to him. This is the first big Twitter space he did. We had like 90,000 people on it, and he was on his jet. <laughs> I remember that, the whole sound of the background. Oh, it's weird. Yeah. And you know, if you, if you haven't listened to it, guys, listen to the Twitter space by, hosted by Mario Nafal, where we talk about the Twitter drops and where I tell him, where's the smoking gun, Elon? I, th this isn't, a, you know, oh, the, the, the Democrats in D.C. worked with the Democrats in Palo Alto. This is news? And I said, where's the smoking gun? Anyway, th the thing about Elon Musk is, if you listen to that 90 minutes, he is like a kid who found a new toy. It's like Christmas Day and he opened the box and I've got a new toy. What's the toy? The toy's politics. I guarantee you this guy hasn't had a political thought for the last 40 years. And then up comes censorship, up comes open border, up comes everything else. And he goes, huh, what, what, what's this Hunter, Hunter Biden laptop thing? Why, why can't I retweet the New York Post story about it before the election? He's found politics and he's playing with it. He doesn't know what he is. He doesn't know whether he's a libertarian or a conservative. He just knows people are attacking America that has given him fortune beyond belief and are attacking the first amendment and he doesn't like it he could be he could be the george soros for the good guys but he's also got some ties to china that are problematic business ties whatever but you know my metric when people say to me you know he's he's just another one of the elitists <laughs> he's pissed off all the right people in the last year the enemies he has made are all the right enemies, from the Washington Post to CNN to the Democrats to AOC. If you're pissing off those people who hate America, you're probably a good guy. Yeah, you know, there's a, um, it's funny you're saying that 40 years he's not, but you know, he just kind of got a hold of this. But knowing his style of a student and curious he is, I can only imagine how obsessed and immersed he is 
with wanting to know everything, yeah. learn everything yeah. about the space, if that's the case, yeah. if you're saying that's the case. Uh, and if he becomes a true believer, uh, that's a pretty heavy weight of a true. Do you have any thoughts on the guy, on the person he just hired as yes. a CEO? Do you have yes. any thoughts on it? I'm curious. So I, I saw all this stuff about her being, yeah. you know, she's a leftist, World Economic Forum, executive director. Look at the interview she did with him. It's all work. I watched the interview. It, was, it wasn't it was bad. And, you know, it's fascinating. The finan my, my engineer on my radio show, he sent me a clip of the Financial Times where it's two unnamed sources, uh, senior executives in advertising said, yeah, if I had to class her, I'd say Linda, is probably a Reagan Republican. And then I go to find, is this woman on Twitter? And I go on Twitter. She's following me, Patrick. <laughs> now, if you're She's watching your moves, just so you know that. You yeah. know, uh, you have to be, I mean, having me on your show, you got balls. So God bless you for having me on your yeah. show, right? Because uh, as far as, you know, the left is concerned, I, uh, I am, you know, the, the devil incarnate, you know, Trump's, what, what did the, the Telegraph call me? Trump's pit bull, right, when I was in the White House. If she's, fo I, I don't have a lot of big uh, ad executives following me on Twitter. I mean, I've got a million plus followers, but big, big ad executives, I think she's probably the only one. Now, that's interesting. And my producer, who has the best political uh, his the marrow bone, he he can he can sniff out a, a, a fake person instantly. He said, "Yeah, you know why he hired her? Because the biggest problem at Twitter now, and you've seen it on your feed, are the crap ads. I mean, he's been hammered since he took her over. They have been targeting him. The left has to get rid of his advertisers. He needs to make that platform profitable. He wants to turn it into the Amazon plus Facebook plus YouTube of the future. The super app. The, the app. He says, I want this app. The app. You only need one app to shop and watch your videos and do so. This is the app. Now, you can't do that without money, without it being profitable. He's just hired a professional, and he can fire her whenever he wants. This is a woman who's there to bring in ad revenue, and I, I'm not worried about this woman. Not at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 I've been following to see what she's saying, how she communicates, what she's doing. I DM'd her. She's, yeah. She hasn't DM'd me back, yeah. so I'm waiting for the I response. I am sure she's got 50,000 <laughs> DMs. No yeah, but what she follows she's me. Come on. Does that kind of pump it up? Like if if it's follow to follow, so it kind of shows it. Yeah, mm. I'm does sure show, she'll eventually get back to does you. Does it show how long she's been following you? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about it. That's a good question. Maybe in the you know, back, back. Maybe it was something you said at a particular moment that inspired her to yeah, follow Gorka. Yeah, but if you're in the ad advertising industry, you know, you don't follow MAGA people. That's, you know, because somebody can see that. You Maybe see that's that. why he hired her, because she has uh, He's smart. the ability to have certain right. ideology, right. but also play ball with certain people on the right. left. And money talks, baby. Let's, let's talk about MAGA people. Let's talk about your experience working with uh, yeah. President Trump and, yeah. and how that was and how you think he's doing right now with all the polls, what's out there. Uh, what's your experience been with him? That's what everybody wants to know. It doesn't matter where I am in the country, what the topic is they've asked me to speak on sooner or later in the Q&A. The question is, what's he really like? And, and the fact is, if, if you've been a, you know, alive for the last 40 years, if you've watched television, if you've seen you know, President Trump, the nice thing about him, and I live in D.C., and it's full of snakes and Janus-faced you know, liars, what you see is what you get. When, when it's just the two of you in the Oval Office, it's exactly the same as if he's in front of 60,000 people in a stadium. Exactly the same. And, and let, me, let me tell you a story about that first meeting in Trump Tower in, in the summer of 15. You've got to understand, I grew up in the UK. So step off, step off a, up a lip, debating club, you know, all very proper, blah, blah, blah. And I walk into this kid from Queen's office, and the Donald's a little bit different. He's not exactly from, you know, uh, private school in West London like mm -hmm. I was. So it got a little bit of getting used to. But within three minutes of talking to this guy, I realized one thing. He hates political correctness and he loves America. And I said, you, you want me to work for you? Fine. You hate political correctness? Number one. Number two, you love America. You think about, you know, I was there when he announced in Mar-a-Lago for the second time. And of course I was there to, you know, cover it for my show and to, you know, support him. But I'm listening to it, and I'm standing there, and it blew my mind, because what has he been put through for the last six years? Have your home raided by armed FBI agents? Have your wife attacked? Have your son attacked? Being called an anti-Semitic white supremacist when your daughter convert, converted to Judaism and your grandkids are Jewish? And you're prepared to step into the arena again 
I salute that. I salute that. So um, a, a great American, bottom line. Whether, whether you like his tweets or not. And when people say the tweets, seriously, six million illegal immigrants, and you're going to talk to me about tweets? I mean, grow up. Just, Will he just tweet go. before? The well, this before. is the I don't know the Will he tweet? That's the big question. The question There's is, a lot of questions. That's probably the most important one. Yeah. Um, I don't know because of Truth Social. I don't know what, what deal he's got with the investors at Truth Social, whether he can't. We'll see. He's got, he's got a year and a half. Does he's, he follow he's you? He's using Instagram. He's using Facebook. He's using everything but, but Twitter. Twitter. Right. So. Does he follow you uh, on Twitter, Sebastian? Does he, fo he only follows like 16, 17 people. I figured you'd be in that list. I don't know. Well, well I haven't checked. Okay. So let's go through Durham report. Okay, yeah. Let's talk about that. So a few things. Uh, Obviously, there's a lot to it. I'll read the story, and I'll just pretty much tee you up, and you can go from there sure. uh, with your background. So um, let me go here. So Jim Jordan urges Congress to use power of the purse against FBI. This is a Washington, Washington Examiner story. Um, uh, to hold the FBI accountable following the release of the Durham report, Jordan urges uh, argues that appropriations can be leveraged to pressure the FBI into reform Stating we got to limit how they spend the money, maybe even limit them. Jordan has been vocal about FBI misconduct, including alleged targeting of anti-abortion groups and conservative activists. He calls for further investigations and discussions with individuals mentioned in the Durham report, stating, are there people that were highlighted in the Durham investigation and the Durham report that we need to talk to on the Judiciary Committee? We're going to give that a good hard look. Some Republicans have even suggested defending or abolishing the FBI. Yesterday, I think a few FBI whistleblowers came out. The mainstream media didn't give it a second of airtime at all. They, they did not talk about it. So t tell us what's going on. Why is mainstream media not talking about it? With everything that's being shared, isn't this enough credibility for them to want to look at this? And if not, why are they not? Because the FBI works for them. The FBI works for the left, works for the Democrats, and works for the media, which is part of the left. It's very simple. So when, when the, the Durham report is 307 pages, it's long. But most Americans are never going to read it. So I, I tweeted this out at, at the weekend. And, I, I, you, know, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of followers, but I very rarely get 366,000 views on a tweet in a couple of days. And here it is. It's just the cliff notes. Haven't read the Durham report? Okay, here are the cliff notes. The FBI and CIA knew Hillary was about to frame candidate Trump. Repeat, the FBI and the CIA knew Hillary was about to frame Trump. Number two, Comey, head of CIA, uh, uh, said of FBI, and Brennan, head of CIA, briefed Obama and Biden on her plot on the summer of 2016. Before the election... Biden, as vice president, and Obama were briefed by the CIA and the FBI that Hillary's going to do this smear job. She's going to lie about Russian collusion. We've got the deets. Biggest conclusion. There was never any evidence of Russian collusion. None. Zero. Zip. You know, Mueller investigation. Uh, impeachment one, impeachment two. No evidence of Russia collusion. Nevertheless, the U.S. government illegally spied on the Trump campaign and us in the Trump White House. Pfizer warrants, Flynn, Carter Page, Manafort, Papadopoulos, on and on and on. And lastly, my conclusion, this isn't the cliff notes, the deep state is real, but Durham didn't have the balls to arrest any of its leaders or their masters, Hillary, Obama, or Biden. 40 years ago, the FBI was the enemy of the, of the left, right? The greatest patriotism is dissent. We hate the man. We hate the G-man. Today, and this, this, this is tough for me to even say, because before I joined the White House, my wife and I had the only external contract to provide training on ISIS and Al-Qaeda to the FBI. I was doing 20,000 miles a month, going from uh, field office to uh, RA to the headquarters to Quantico, briefing the FBI, training the agents. I trained thousands of agents and uh, SOS support staff and uh, intelligence analysts. If the FBI knocked on my door tonight, I'd say, screw you, talk to my attorneys. If you've lost me, you, I mean, if you've lost Dan Bongino, if you've lost me, if you've lost, you know, hardcore MAGA, it is irredeemable. There's no way to salvage this entity. This entity must be dismantled because we have a political police force in America and it's called the FBI. And it's not just about President Trump or, or you know, Paul Manafort or Steve Bannon. It's about, you know, Catholic preachers in Philly 
having their home raided by armed FBI agents. It's about January 6ers who didn't even enter the building and get charged with a felony. That's political police. I'm sorry. But how did that happen, though? If at one point they were the anti-left, when did they become the anti-right? So I just did an interview with a guy who had 21 years in, um, uh, Michael Van Meter. He's an FBI guy, supervisory special agent. It's on it's on my America First uh, Rumble feed if you want to watch it. And he's fast. He he said this happened right after Louis Freed. When when Louis Freed came in, you started to see lawyers being brought into the leading positions on the seventh floor in the Hoover Building, not not agents. And then um, after 9-11, Mueller was told, remember, this is this is a pivotal moment in FBI history. Bush, after 9-11, told Mueller, the then FBI director, your job is to prevent the next 9-11. H- hang on a second. We're cops. Cops don't prevent crime. Cops arrest and investigate crimes. Now the FBI is meant to prevent them, which means it becomes an intelligence service, not a law enforcement agency. If you don't believe me, the, the URL, the, 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 not the URL, the address for FBI employees ends with .ic. It's fbi.gov.ic. Why? Intelligence community. They are now a spy agency. But they're spying on who? Americans. That's the problem. Mueller, Comey. It starts with free to a certain extent. Mueller and then uh, uh, Comey turn it into an intelligence agency with a political prerogative. Think about the fact. We, we just had this drop yesterday. The FISA court issued, well, it took a year to get it, a report in which there were 270,000 FISA warrants that were illegal. Um, Not FISA warrants, FISA surveillance requests. Over a million Americans? A quarter of a million Americans? What what are we talking about? White supremacy is the biggest threat to America? This is what the president said at at a college a week ago. This is insanity. This is, I used to give lectures on the FBI to new agents and, and military officers and say, you know what's really weird about America? America is the only developed nation in the world that doesn't have an internal security service. There's no MI6. There's no Bundesverfassungsschutz like there is in Germany, in America. We don't, do, we don't, we don't have political security because of the nature of the country and how we were born. I don't, I don't give that lecture anymore because we have a political police force and it's the FBI and it cannot be redeemed. When you've got Dan Bongino, former Secret Service guy, say it's got to be taken down. When you've got people like Steve Gray, 23 years in the FBI, say on my show, no, nope, irredeemable. Carl Serafin, whistleblower, irredeemable. Give its three main missions to other agencies. It doesn't matter who you change at the top, who you put into the seventh floor of the, of the Hoover building. This agency is irredeemable. I, I, look, you've served. You're a specialist, right? I know that you or I, if you're in the Philly field office and the assistant the super, super, supervisory special agent says, hey, we've got this warrant. There's this guy, Mark Houck, and um, he, uh, he uh, pushed this abortion protester at a, at a Planned Parenthood clinic who was screaming at his 12-year-old son. And they charged him with a misdemeanor, but the local court dismissed it. They said, you're protecting your kid. This guy's a loony. We're not going to charge you, but we're going to go in there anyway. Put on your ceramic plated vest, get your M4, load it. We're going to raid his home. What would you do, Patrick? I know what I'd do. I'd say, here's my badge. Here's my creds. I'm not your stinking Gestapo. I resign. How many are doing that? Well, 20 of them did it for Mark Houck's house. So here's here's why I don't buy the Hannity thing. Oh, it's just the bad apples on the top floor. Bullshit. It's not the the bad apples. If you don't have, you've got tens of thousands of agents and intelligence uh, analysts and support staff. If you're not striking, if you're not outside the building picketing saying, we are not your Gestapo, sorry, you're one of the bad guys. We've We've got less than 20 whistleblowers out of tens of thousands of people at the FBI headquarters and across the nation, less than 20 whistleblowers. And you know what's really freaky? Nobody from DOJ. The people who give the orders, not one whistleblower. Why do you think? Because it's that, when I was in the White House, I realized very, very early on, all of government is corrupt. You know, when, when Obama sicked the, the IRS on, on you know, Tea Party patriots, 
uh, it's all corrupt. The worst, the DOJ. The DOJ is literally a wing of the Democrat Party. It's just a political tool. Can I ask you a question regarding yeah. the FBI? And uh, I hear what you're saying. I mean, you make some very valid points, especially with the, the news of the Durham report. I want to just go back in time a little bit because we were he's, Pat's saying, how did this happen? So it's purely speculation, yeah, yeah. opinion. Um, we all remember in 2016, I think eight days before the election, it was James Comey who went up on stage and potentially, as they say, cost Hillary the election. He basically said at this time, Hillary's emails, Hillary's emails, Hillary, it was sloppy as hell. He didn't charge her with anything, but basically said it was careless to an extent. And then obviously Trump won the election. How much do you think that, uh, and we also remember when Comey was still the FBI director, he was in that room like basically hiding behind uh, the, the drapes. He's 6'8", he's trying to blend in. Do you remember that? It was like, all right, we see you, Jim. You're 6'8", buddy. But how much do you think it's almost like a mea culpa, basically on the FBI's behalf, basically saying, yes, we are the ones essentially responsible for Trump, whether you agree with that or not, that they're basically reversing course and saying, all right, we cost Hillary the election, so let's see what we, it's politicization of the FBI for sure, or the yeah. weaponization. I, but going back in time to Pat's question, how did this all happen? This is just something that comes to mind for me. Look, that that, that press conference is infamous. I mean... I, <laughs> You've got to watch it again. It's 13 minutes long, and for 12 and a half minutes, Comey lists every crime she committed. Mm -hmm. you know, 18 TSSCI secret emails, topped and tailed, put onto a private server. That, that's illegal. So that means somebody goes into a skiff, goes into a secure facility with a thumb drive, which is illegal if you're a U.S. employee, or with a camera, which is illegal, to photograph classified emails, takes them out, downloads them, and then sends them on an unsecured server to Hillary's uh, email system, which is in her bathroom, Right. That's a, that, yeah. If I did that once, if you did that once when you're a specialist, you're in the brig and you ain't coming out. You're going in there for 20 years, okay? Because the Espionage, espionage Act is clear. Intent is irrelevant. It's one of the few parts of the U.S. Code where intent is irrelevant. Whether you're a spy or whether you're a moron like Aldrich Ames and you leave your briefcase of classified stuff on the subway and metro, on the metro by accident, doesn't matter. It's classified information. You go away. She did it 18 times in just that press conference. And the last 90 seconds he said... Which, isn't, which he's not allowed to do. He's the director of the FBI. He's not the freaking AG. He says, but no reasonable prosecutor or judge would bring charges against this woman. I had a buddy working in the Chelsea JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York. <laughs> he said, there were people in the, this is an FBI unit that is interagency. When they heard Comey say that, they got up, it was a Tuesday, I think, a Tuesday. They got up from their desks, put on their jackets, left the building, and didn't come back till Monday. They were so disgusted by what he did, which wasn't helping Trump. He exonerated her. He exonerated her. And he has no right to do that. So, no reasonable person would bring charges. Uh, excuse me? You're not even allowed to say that. You're the FBI director. You're not a prosecutor. You're not a judge. And you exonerate? Why? Because she's a friend of yours? Because you want to stay in that position? He was trying to save her. He wasn't destroying her. Now, it didn't work out too well, mm -hmm. but his motivation was to save her ass. Why do you think Trump kept him on as FBI director? <sighs> it's, it, it's ironic for a guy who's a uh, 14-season long TV show uh, whose motto was, You're fired! Right, exactly. Between you and me and your, your, your viewers, he hates firing people. <laughs> That's why he does it on Twitter so much. Because he, he, the person, it just, he really does. You're saying the guy who is most known for yeah, firing people, they're that, fired, uh, right? Does not enjoy firing no, people. He doesn't. He doesn't. Sebastian, I don't know if I'm buying that you, one. You don't have to. Talk, yeah. to talk to people who worked in the White House like me and ask him. He really doesn't like doing that. I, I don't know why he didn't do it earlier. That, that guy should have been. Well, he should have used his uh, namesake and his catchphrase day one with Comey, don't he, you think? He should have, yeah, and with many other people. Look, you have to understand one thing about President Trump. And I love as an immigrant having to remind my fellow Americans who were born here. Do you know what you did in 2016? Americans did something really funky in 2016. Because from George Washington to Obama, there's a connection. Every single president in America, every single president is a member of the political elite. Every single one. Mm -hmm. Former senators, congressmen, governors, or retired generals. Every single one. Along comes a real estate mogul from New York with a reality TV show 
who's never run for any, I mean, even Reagan couldn't win first time. This guy runs the first time and he wins. 64 million Americans, as my, my buddy Bongino says, you know, double barrel middle finger <laughs> to, to, to the political elite. <laughs> elects somebody who's never served as county dog catcher, let alone the president. How does he know how DC works? He's not a politician. Who does, how does he know what Comey's really like? If Comey, you know, uh, brown noses him. This is, this is why round two is gonna be different. If we do our part and we get him reelected, dude, it's gonna be very different, very different. I, I said this in an interview with PBS and uh, they stole it and they, they didn't run the interview, but they used my line as the, the title for the, for the documentary with, with Bannon and everybody else. People need to understand when we walked into that building, I walked into that building January 21st, uh, the day after the inauguration. It was a Saturday, but I was on the clock. I'm a deputy. I'm going into work. When we walked into that building, there were less than 20, less than 20 people in senior positions like me who were MAGA, America first, and understood why 64 million Americans said, yeah, we don't want a politician. We had to fill 4,000 positions, presidential positions, 4,000, and run a government of more than 2 million people. Now, uh, God bless Steve Bannon, but he actually said in an interview for Rolling Stone or Vogue or some stupid publication, he had to use this word. Two weeks into the administration, we didn't have enough bodies, so Reince and I made a, quote, drug deal with the RNC to fill the positions. I think that explains what happened for the next four years. When you bring in bushies, when you bring in rhinos, when you just have people with a pulse but who hate them. I, I was a deputy assistant to the president. Now, I didn't know what that meant, okay, because I'd worked in the military and the DOD. It outranks a four-star general. I didn't realize that until I rolled up to DIA for a lecture on, this, on, the, on China and they treated me like, you know, the second coming. I, I you know, the, 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 the two stars are coming out to greet me and take me to the VIP, blah, blah, blah. What? You're a deputy. There's only 42 of us in government, 42 deputy assistants to the president. Six months into my term, I realized there's another DAP in the building, another deputy assistant, my rank, who detests the president, who utterly hates Trump and everything he stands for which is weird because being a deputy assistant to the president, you're not shanghai you're not given the queen's shilling with a gun put to your head. You will be an outranking four-star civilian. No, you actually volunteered to do it. But you're in the, what, to get a check, check mark on your resume? You're gonna come into a building and work for a guy who you can't stand. That's not gonna happen again. So how do you think this time will be different? Knowing what you know now, if you had people right. insulated in the administration right. that basically hated Trump, which is insane to me. like he's we, have, we have people like General Kelly. I mean, think about it. General Kelly was the chief of staff. Yeah, that is one of the most powerful before. people yes. in, in the world. And I love them. Marine Corps is my favorite service. I spent two and a half years teaching at Quantico. I love the Marines. And it pains me to say he was a subversive. He should be in prison right now. I mean, to th think of this. Corey Lewandowski, good buds with the president. Never worked in the administration, but he'd come in all the time to talk to the president. And he'd never tell Kelly. Kelly would get irate. He'd get pissed. And I can tell you this because Corey said this in a Fox interview. One day, he was coming out of the Oval. Kelly saw Corey, grabbed Corey, and flung him against the wall so hard he ripped the button off his jacket. General Kelly did that to Gen Corey Lewandowski. Yeah, and said, you don't effing come in my building without my permission. He was chief of staff at the time? My building? Nobody freaking mm. elected you to nothing. Oh, yeah, you're a big, you know, Marine, retired. Nobody elected. My building? That cannot happen again. What, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. um, there's only two jobs I, I'd be prepared to do in the next administration. One of them is personnel. Um, uh, there's another person who's already been um, Vetted. given the nod, yeah. and he's a friend of mine, and if he gets it, <clears throat> we've had a discussion. I'll help you in whatever way you need. Uh, Reagan said it best. Policy uh, is personnel. Personnel is policy. It doesn't matter what your issue is. I'm a big Second Amendment guy. But whether it's uh, sanctity of life, whether it's the border, whether it's economy, it doesn't matter what your issue is. If you don't get personnel right, 
you're not going to get anything done. Rule number one, if we win, if we do our part, we have to have a filter system that only allows people who love America into the building. End of story. So it's not about Trump. It's not about Republicans, people who love America. Who would those names be? Meaning, uh, you know, the last, because the cr- criticism is some of the older guys don't want to come back. You know, this yeah. person's not coming back. Yeah. Daughter's not coming back. Cushion's not this one. Nobody wants a job back. Everybody's kind of hesitating. Who would be the part of the new team? Yeah. So this is, I'm working on an article that's exactly those for my Substack. you know, the, the, the names of the cabinet and who should come in. This is, this is a challenge. My friend has the morning show in DC, Chris Plant, great radio host. And he said, one of the greatest successes of the left in the last 20 years is to guarantee that good men and women will never work in a Republican conservative administration. And he's right. Why would you? Why would you be a Justice Kavanaugh even? Why would you risk having you know, loonies come to your house with zip ties and a gun to kill you and your children? I, you know, I'm, I thought I was used to it, but then when I came into the administration, they came after my wife, they came after my son. There was one journalist who wrote 52 hit pieces in me, on me in two months, one of which was about my 18-year-old son and used the word traitor in the headline about my high school age son. Why would you do that? So it's going to be a challenge. What what I said to Mike Flynn at the beginning, the National Security Advisor, I said, because we inherited a National Security Council, there's 420 people. It was insane. Obama created this massive, massive NSC. And I said, Mike, get rid of them all. Send them back to their agencies because most of them come from, you know, state or CIA or DOD. And put some good people at the top of each one as senior directors, and then let's fill it with people from the campaign. Let's bring in people who work their ass off to get President Trump elected, who don't know the difference between Sunni and Shia, but give me six months and I will train them. I will, I will be there, they will be there till 10 o'clock at night, they will learn the rudiments of national security, and at least they'll be loyal to the will of 64 million Americans. And, and you know, a, a week later, Mike was fired. So you want to bring in greenies, or do you want to bring in some big names? Well, I think we've got we got a year and a half. No, we we got we got a year and a half to find cadre and to convince people. Uh, we've got to have the top line locked in. We've got to have the cabinet members. We've got to have the senior directors. We've got to have the DASDs, the assistant secretaries, all locked in. But it can't be. Pe- we. I don't want to get into too much in the way and tell me if I'm talking too much. All the big appointments used to go through our office, through Bannon's office. So we'd get these spreadsheets every week of people who want to come into the administration. There was one spreadsheet we received, and this is unclassified, of people who are applying to the top jobs in the DOD, like Assistant Secretary of Defense, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. And I looked at the spreadsheet <laughs> before I gave it to Bannon, and I said, where, where are we getting these names? Because there's a column on the right-hand side, referred by. Four of the people on this spreadsheet had been referred by Michelle Flournoy. Michelle Flournoy was Obama's, you know, top Pentagon official. People, people actually coming into the Trump administration are putting Michelle Flournoy. I mean, just put, you know, Podesta. J- just put Axelrod, why don't you? That can't happen again. That cannot happen again. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, that that part is going to be uh, uh, interesting to watch who's part of the cabinet, who's part of the team, because uh, some people, the criticism of uh, uh, first term was the fact that the draining of the swamp didn't happen. And I wonder, is it a, is a part of it where, you know, you know how in, in fights uh, or, you know, a game, you lose the game and, you know, the opponent hug each other or even in UFC, hey, man, this was a great fight. You know, you're really great. You really brought it. And I got to give some respect to him. You know, this fight wouldn't be this way. And then you become friends. Is it almost there's a side of you when you go into this space that is filled with, you know, backstabbing, dirty, and you're like, you know what? I think they're going to be noble. So let me have a meeting with Romney the next day. You know, let me bring these other guys in. And then you're like, Let's make this work. Maybe I can change them. Maybe if they really see how good I am, we can really unify this group. And then you make the mistake of keeping the commies, keeping everybody. Yeah. Like, no, 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 yeah. no. Yeah. They're not who you think they are. This is not capitalism. This is not business. This is not corporate. These guys are darker and dirtier than you think. Stay strong and bring true believers in. Is that the evolution that he had to go through with his yeah. first term? Yeah, okay. and, and also he's in a territory that he's never been in before. 
right? I'm a, I'm a geopolitics guy. I'm a broadcaster. Don't ask me to play a you know, concert piano. It's not <laughs> you will have a very bad concert. Or who won the uh, Celtics Heat game? Nuggets uh, last, or yeah. whatever it was, right? <laughs> no clue. No, no, is that no, a cricket no, no, match? Cricket or asked. rugby, <laughs> right? Um, so he's in a completely new environment. But but to your point, two things. Let's talk about the left and let's talk about our side. On our side, the establishment really thinks he's a joke. He's an anomaly that the American people just chose the wrong person by accident. They really think, I mean, Chris Christie's going to announce. Chris Jabba the Hutt's going to announce. Does he really think <laughs> that anybody in America is going to vote for him? I mean, Asa Hutchinson? Asa Hutchinson? You, you, you could literally be a diplodocus from prehistoric times and you're running for the presidency? The establishment thinks that Donald Trump is a blip. It's, a, it's an accident. We're going to get back to normal and footsie under the table with the Democrats and the sweet deals with China and we'll be fine. He's just, he's just, weird, just an accident. It's perverse. Get back to normal. So you can't deal with those guys because they think you're a freak. And the other side, let me give you an example. <laughs> I, I was thrown in day three of the administration, right, because we dropped the travel ban and it was not well communicated. And I could see that it wasn't being well communicated. So I texted Bannon on a Friday night. I said, Steve, you know, we've got to explain this better. Like, this isn't anti-Muslim. Uh, this is based upon a threat assessment that Obama left us of the seven nations that cannot tell us who, are, who the people are who are coming across the border. This is their threat assessment. We're just initiating it. And, and, and Bannon, typical Bannon, you know, doesn't sleep. 3 a.m., he texts me back. He says, tell Spicer now to use you. Now, I didn't go into the administration to do media. I went there to do behind-the-scenes national security. So, okay, Spicer, uh, Bannon says use me. So I am literally dropped into the pit of hell, the Saturday morning, Sunday, Friday, doing all the CNN. I mean, this is the fun stuff that people keep talking to me about. You know, when I destroyed Cuomo, when I was on with you know, MSNBC, and I was an effective communicator. After I was effectively communicating all this stuff for the president, Senator Durbin wrote a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security to investigate my naturalization and to have me kicked out of the country. Dick Durbin from Illinois? Yeah. These, these are, this, isn't, this isn't a political difference. This is when, when the other side thinks, I can destroy you. You must have lied on your immigration papers. You must be deported because you're an effective communicator for the president, right? This isn't politics. This isn't, you know, Tip O'Neill having a beer with Ronald Reagan, you know, Friday night. Every the week. left wants to destroy us. Every week they got together. Every week. Once upon a time, there was a time in this yeah, country where right. Tip and Gip would get together and have lunch in Rose Garden. And there was a certain nobility of it um, and where they were. Let me ask you a question. Uh, but, but let me just add to that. Think, of, think about what Brennan has said. Brennan, John Brennan still has his security clearances. He's a former CIA director. He, on national cable television, he said the incumbent president is a traitor who works for Russia. S excuse me? I mean, politics has been dirty for a long time. But to say the guy in the White House actually works for the Kremlin, that's not politics. That's evil. You've got a good playbook on the people you're talking about here. But right now, when, when you get into all these presidential candidates and people coming in, um, you, you've got to read on this. Because I've always observed it and seen as it's one of two things. I want a cabinet position or I want the VP slot. And yeah. these are the B candidates that are running and saying, well, I'm going to deliver bundled donations <laughs> and my support. Right. You know, once I bow out, which will be 11 minutes after South Carolina. Bingo. They, remember, it used to be New Hampshire, right. Iowa, South Carolina, something of those side before yeah. the calendar got effed right. with, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do here, I'm going to whisper that, okay, hey, listen, I've got $6.5 million in the war chest. I'm going to back you up. Uh, how about commerce? Yeah. And they're like, okay, I respectfully bow out after South Carolina, and I say, please get behind this candidate. And, and there's almost this... This, this, what you are is your proxy campaigners, right? How much of that is going on right now? And who do you think is legitimately serious that actually thinks, delusional or not, that they can make it? And who is out there that are really just self-nominating and auditioning as part of this 
meat grinder process. Yeah, th this may shock you. I don't hang out a lot with politicians because I don't like them. So, um, but you have a playbook. I have a playbook. You have a mental playbook, oh, so, and you so, have eyes to see and ears to hear. Here, here are the, so, what do you think? Here are the dynamics. Uh, let, let me just expand upon upon your analysis a little bit. So, yes, number one, this this kind of aggregating of funds and then passing over to the other guy, and hopefully you'll get you know a kickback and you'll become a member of the cabinet. Absolutely, absolutely. More important is the ego. And this is what's happening with Ron. People are whispering into Ron's ear every single day, you're the guy, you're the guy. Yeah, you, you can really do it, you're the guy. So the, the grifter class, the, the strategists who get paid whether they win or lose, and mostly they lose on our side, are saying, yeah, I'll be your campaign manager. Let, let me be your, your, your bundler, boy, man. You can do it, Ron. You're the man. So the, basically, so the grifter class, let me interrupt you real quick. The grifter class, because a lot of people who are listening may not understand that, there are political consultants yeah. and other people the strategic that advisors. during the campaign yeah. will make millions of dollars for themselves millions and their companies. Millions and millions and millions of dollars, and so they don't whether care. they win or lose. That's correct. You go into the arena, you get stabbed and torn up by a lion. Right. Doesn't matter. Check right. cash. Here's, here's my invoice. <laughs> so, so, Keep going. So, so these guys. When it comes to the field right now, I really think Ron believes that he can win, which is amazing. He's 40 points down and he thinks he can win. And and I like him. I'll preface it. I like him. Vivek. I think Vivek really, Vivek is like a little bit like the Elon Musk. I got a new toy. It's politics. It's fun. And he wants to save America. He's an, uh, I think he's a son of immigrants. Yeah, he's a son of immigrants. He loves America. Uh, Vivek, I, of all the people, I'd like to see Vivek in the Trump administration to have the Jared role. He should be the innov uh, innovator, economic growth, you know, all of that stuff. He, he should be doing all that stuff for the president. True believer. The uh, yeah, a true, a true believer in America. But I also think, having interviewed him on my show, he really thinks he can be president. Well, it's fine. It's fine. But okay. in the... To go back to your saying, yeah. being insulated with people who are all about the MAGA agenda, do you think Vivek Ramaswamy he isn't. is really on that same page as Trump? Because he's been pretty critical of Trump, don't you think? No, I, I, it depends what, what you mean on the page with. Uh, in terms of loving America and believing America is great, 100%. Does he agree with everything President Trump says? Why would he? Why but if he's going to have the Jared role, doesn't he have oh, to? But, but, doesn't but look, he have but, to be but look, that? Look, look at Cap. Look, look. No, Cap. You know, team of uh, Ryan. I know what you're saying. I don't think so. Yeah. You don't think what? I, I agree. I don't think he does because this is a form of shown strength. It's like yeah. It's like Barnes being recruited by Kobe. It's like. Uh, Ron Artest, you're not disrespecting, but I'm not afraid of you. Right. That is a good sign to want to have somebody like that part of your team. Yeah. It's how Kamala got her job, although her job was a little bit more disrespectful. He doesn't like yes men. <clears throat> President Trump does not like yes men. So, so, so let's 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 stay on this. You talk about Ron. Okay, who's in his ear? Okay. Uh, uh, last weekend we were at uh, not last weekend, whatever last Thursday or something. We spent a few hours with him at the governor's mansion. Just ourselves, 10, 15 other people were invited. To uh, uh, to kind of watch how he is and what he says right. and the approach and all this other stuff, and I've been very critical of uh, the governor. I I, I I think he's done a phenomenal job for the state, but I think his marketing team absolutely sucks and they need to be fired and found a new person. And some people think that could be a relative, but I think the marketing team needs help. So now that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, one, I'll start off by just ask, asking you an open-ended question uh, uh, about him. Uh, as a candidate on who's in his ear, is he making the right job running today? Should he not be running? Should he be running? And what's the best case or the worst case scenario here at the end of this election, 2024, for specifically Governor Ron DeSantis? So I, I, somebody sent me a load of bumper stickers that are in my green room at my studio that say 2024 uh, Trump DeSantis. I said that for months, for months, Trump DeSantis. If he's smart, Politically, if he's a strategic thinker, which I don't think he is, he comes in as Veep, and then he or a member of the cabinet, whatever, and then he slides seamlessly into the top slot for 2028. That's not happening now. Number one, this weird thing that he hasn't declared. Dude, you changed the constitution of Florida so you can run as an incumbent governor. What the hell are you waiting for? And then after the brag announcement and the indictment, he's toast. Oh, two things. The flip-flop on Ukraine. And then the brag indictment, this guy, this guy is not ready for prime time. What he did on that press conference the Monday after the indictment leaked was despicable. As a former, former Jag in the Navy to say, I'm not going to get involved in these things. Dude, he's a resident of Florida. You are involved whether you like it or not. And not once, but twice to make the, I don't know about hush money for porn stars. You're a child. That, that's the, we saw the real Ron DeSantis on that Monday presser. You said that not once. But twice? 
of a president who actually made you governor. Let's be clear. He was like 12 points behind the other guy in the primary. President Trump taps him, and he's number one. And why is he popular? It's like, you know, everybody loves Austin Powers. What is Ron DeSantis? He's the mini-me to President Trump. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sorry? What he's doing in, in here is Trumpian, whether it's taking on the transgender, the DEI, open for business. I mean, this, this is you know, a little version of President Trump in Florida. And then you flip-flop on Ukraine, not ready for prime time. Sorry. Do you think it's leadership? Do you think it's policy? Do you think character. it's marketing? It's character. You, tell me what you mean by it's character. It's character. He doesn't have it. So, I, I, can't, I can't explain it better. Saturday, Saturday night, it leaks. Yes. That the man who campaigned on I will put Trump in prison, who got a million dollars from George Soros and then becomes the DA in Manhattan, that man is going to charge President Trump with 34 total garbage out of date, misdemeanors magically turned into felonies. And on Monday, you have a press conference about something, and the reporter says, what's your reaction to the news of the indictment of the 45th president? Well, I don't know about hush money for porn stars, and let me repeat that again, and I I'm gonna concentrate on Florida, so I'm not gonna talk about this. You're a former military prosecutor. You're a former JAG. You don't have an opinion on this? That the 45th president, after the Mar-a-Lago raid, is now facing the Manhattan DA. Oh, and by the way, he's a resident of the state you're governor of, and he helped make you governor. You're a child, Ron. You're a child. You're like in high school. You're like in the clique. Hey, I don't like him. She's ugly. It's like... Come on, grow up. So which part of his character do you think failed him there? You've got integrity, Ma personal Ma Ma discipline, Ma loyalty. What part of the honor. character? Honor. Honor? It's a lack of honor. It's a lack of honor. So self-interested pride leads him to a lack of honor? L ch churlish, childish attitude to questions of honor. I mean, sorry. I, I don't care who you are. You shouldn't have to be a former prosecutor. But to say that what has happened against this man is not political persecution... You're not a good person to say that. This man's home was raided. His wife's wardrobes were turned over by armed agents of the federal government, despite the fact that his home is protected by the Secret Service. And you have nothing to say about that? Nothing to say about that. That's a lack of honor. Well, he's expected to declare this week. Well, it's supposed to be, it was supposed to be yesterday. I mean, how many times have we heard, next Monday, Ron's declaring. What's he waiting for? Fair, fair enough, but <laughs> this is supposed to be the week, and for all intents and purposes, I'm very confident he is going to be declaring any day now. Okay. So, pass is pass, bad, pass bad, is bad, prologue, bad move. I get it. Don't do it, don't do it. But he's going to do it, I respect your opinion here, but he's going to do it, uh -huh. and Casey DeSantis is very closely aligned with uh, helping him run this. Um do you not like his chances whatsoever? You see that Republican mega donors are basically now running his direction. He's basically well, not, not just Republican mega donors. I mean, this is this is the stuff that people really need to wake up to and you know get red pilled. Ken Griffin, Citadel Capital, Obama Bundler is funding mm -hmm. him. Can we just repeat that sentence for everybody who missed it? Obama Bundler, mm -hmm. billionaire Ken Griffin is funding Ron DeSantis. You why, also why? see people like Peter Thiel, potentially yeah, yeah. even Elon but, Musk. But, but think about this. Why, him why, up. why is an Obama bundler, Obama bundler, even being allowed to give him a dollar? This is this is creepy. This is weird, right? Why this would he not strange. be allowed to give DeSantis money? Well, is he MAGA, or is he is he but, is he is he deep state Obama buddy? I'll take you whoever whoever's money. Is is he America first? Isn't or Citadel is he... Capital based in Illinois? So potentially there's a relationship there. He's the senator of Illinois. You, Obama you, you, was. I, I go back to my primary statement here. Mm -hmm. America is divided by those who love America and those who hate it. This guy hates America. Who hates America? Ken Griffin. Griffin. Yeah, totally. Think Ken Griffin, who's made if billions of giving... dollars, hates America. Yeah. Uh, you know, George Soros is rich, right? And hates yeah, um, we're not saying... I mean, you're, are you saying <laughs> being, that Ken Being Griffin, rich doesn't mean you love America. I hear you, but you're saying that Ken Griffin totally. is George Soros? To if you're bundling for the man who, who rode on the I will fundamentally trans uh, transform America, yeah. If you're a former bundler for the guy who said, I hate America so much, I'm going to change it until you can't recognize it, whose wife on Inauguration Day says, this is the first time in my life I'm proud of America... Yeah.
Europe. So who said that? Michelle, Michelle Obama. Okay. Michelle Obama. Yeah, it's a problem. The, these are the things that you have to pick <clears throat> up on. You can't, can't smooth these over. I'm trying, say, to, I'm trying to unpack everything you just said. So number one, uh, uh, the question was asked of Giuliani of him running as a VP. Apparently he cannot because they're both residents of the state of Florida. Giuliani. So apparently you can't, Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani. Regarding he, DeSantis. Regarding right? DeSantis yeah. running with Trump, apparently yeah. he can't because they're both residents you, you, of the you, state of Florida. One of them has to move out. That's, yeah. the, that's the part. One right. of them has to move right. out. That's so that's not, of course, if they decided that one can go to New York, right. and that's not going to be hard to do. So that's one. Number two, in regards to his comments right after uh, what happened at Mar-a-Lago, uh, can I think about it from a competitive standpoint, a moment of personal interest, knowing the guy that's in the way of your lifelong dream becoming a reality just got you know indicted and they went to his place and this is pretty much a short shot for you to become a president and you're excited about it. So let me just you know capitalize on this. Yes, does that show a quality of selfishness that the guy that helped you get there now you're not defending him okay fair that's a very fair assessment on what you're saying uh, uh you know what happens next with his announcement him delaying it i don't understand that part it's a shit show to me you come out with your book four months ago yeah when you come out with a book that book is only a book written for election to run for office nobody the timing the playbook has always been the same write the book launch it, right. go out there talking about it so people can read your book and say, okay, this is what this guy is running on. Fine. I like him. I don't like him. I didn't know that this was cool. And by the way, I actually think it's a great book. I think he missed the mark with the book. I read the book. I thought he edified Trump multiple, multiple times in the book. This would have been a very good opportunity. But maybe somebody said it's not that big of a book. Just do a couple different things here and there and then go out. Then you lose a Megyn Kelly who doesn't like a Trump that calls you out for not agreeing to go on her show and talk to other people like us, that is going to move your book. You don't want to do that? Okay, that's that's not a good look. Now, on the flip side, for you saying what you said about his mishaps, the people that are not Trump people could say, are you kidding me? Do you want me to talk about the 15 mishaps with what the president said and what he did in his past and this and this and that? That's going to be their argument. So I think that kind of cancels each other out. The question then becomes, okay, so uh, uh, I asked this question of uh, 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 Clay Travis and Buck Sexton, okay? They're here, and I said, I said, you guys sound like a, a spokesperson for DeSantis. That's what you sound like because they were both very much uh, good guys, but they're both not necessarily siding with Trump. They're siding more with DeSantis. Great, but here's the question that I asked. It was kind of interesting, by the way, because you know where I'm going to go with this, what they said. And I asked this from Tulsi. For uh, uh, your thoughts here, how much uh, power does the right person giving you money and endorsing you have in a presidential election? How much power uh, influence does that have? I, I thank the good Lord. I've never been in the room where, you know, a donor or a rep of a donor has said to somebody I know, you know, we did give you a million bucks last year. What are you going to do for us? Now, that's how DC works, right? The lobby, the lobbying functions on that basis, yeah, right? Yeah. So Pfizer gives you X, mm -hmm. and then the guy help from Pfizer helps you write the, the legislation that goes to the Senate aid office, and then that gets chewed around and put into the legislation. So that, that's politics. Sam. No doubt about that, by the no. way. You're spot on with Co that. Of course not. I mean, that, that's, that's why lobbying exists. Yeah, but this is where I'm going with that. I'm, I'm asking, like, okay. The endorsement, the power of me being Schwartzman saying, I got DeSantis. We're going right. with DeSantis. Right. Citadel, we're going with DeSantis. Teal, going with DeSantis. By the way, Schwartzman is not 100% confirmed because they came out. So nobody fully knows yet. I right. think we'll find out in the next three to six months. But let's say a Musk comes out and says, I don't think we should have a president above the age of 69. Okay, mm -hmm. seven mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. Rogan, hey, you know, DeSantis more than Trump, right? right? Some of these guys. How much influence today... With the social, you're seeing Trump being on Nelk Boys and, you know, 10 million views. And this is a younger audience that you're appealing to, that you go into places like right. that. How much influence do the right uh, uh, endorsements have in a presidential election? Like if Musk said, I'm Team DeSantis 100%, right. and let's just say he gave, I don't know, let's pick a number, $50 million, $100 million, okay, to a pack, and I'm going DeSantis, or I'm going Trump, vice how much influence does a person like that have? If I could answer that, I, I, I would not be sitting here. Uh, I would be, you know, flying my helicopter around tropical islands with my kids. You know, that, that is the question. 
Is right. that a desire? We can get you a helicopter if that's well, what you're saying. Let's, let's do that. Can we schedule love, this a helicopter? A fa- fast tropical. One. A fast one. We're going to do that. Done. All right. There are several Bahamas um, 30 minutes away. We could fire. Let's them. do it. Um, that, you know, how much is an endorsement worth it? I, I watched all of your Tulsi interview, and I think she said the, the right answer depends upon who's doing the endorsing. Let's right? say Musk. And, and who the candidate is. Let's say Musk and um, Trump or DeSantis. He, his, so here's my response response i think 24 2024 is going to be a lot like carter versus reagan because it's going to boil down to one question are you better this is what reagan asked the american people are you better off than you were four years ago it's not about anybody else richard barris is the only pollster i trust in america rich was on my show last week and he said the only question it's not it's not about DeSantis. it's not about anybody else it's not about kamala it's about Biden versus Trump. That's the next election. That's the only question. That's the only question people have in their mind. Do you think Trump should debate the other guys on the Republican side or not? I, you know what? One of the things I'm very grateful to President Trump for, apart from you know, hiring me, is do you remember how fun politics was? He made fun, politics fun again. Those primaries were awesome. I mean, I would love to see 30 people on the primary debate stage. It's like, you know, WWF. Let's do it. Bring it. I, I, everybody, just, and you think he would welcome that? Yeah, he yeah. loves that stuff. So that's the part I agree with. Because a lot of people stuff. are saying the fact that Trump's not going to do, you know, the debates and all that. I think he's looking forward to it. Because for him, you ever seen him being roasted? You know, what is that when they do the roast and Snoop gets up there and all these guys are roasting him? The, and the gridiron. Yeah, the comedy he, he, central. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he just sits there and he takes right. it. You know, most right. people are not brave enough to be roasted. Mm. I actually think he is a roaster. And I think a natural roaster. Totally. I think he can't wait to roast all these guys on the right with the debate. But going back to the question, yeah. going back to the question, you still haven't answered it. No, because I, I don't think I... I, I, I just I, your I, opinion. I'm not look, looking for I, a factual I, statement. I would be super excited if Elon said, yeah, Trump's the guy. But I don't think it really makes a difference. I, I don't think people walk in to the ballot box and say, yeah, I'm voting for but, but, Ron but, but because... I agree. But, no, but I don't disagree. But here's the question. I don't disagree if anybody endorses Trump, meaning... The Trump vote, no one cares if you endorse him. Right. right. Do you understand what I'm saying? But what, but what matters is to DeSantis. Oh, DeSantis. So if yeah. a Musk says, I'm DeSantis and here's 50, 100 million bucks, how big of an endorsement you know is that for DeSantis? I'll give you my answer. Please. It's irrelevant. You think so? It's irrelevant. Why is that? Because politics has become, since, since Brexit, Trump, Modi, Orban, and uh, Maloney... Politics has been boiled down to one thing and one thing alone, authenticity. It, really, it, it, doesn't, it really, doesn't matter money. Do you know how much money Hillary spent against us? We spent $800,000, $800 million. million. Uh, legally, what we know of legally, she spent $1.4 billion. Are, had, you, are you calling Biden the most authentic president of all time? <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying they stole the election. <laughs> Well, I, that's it. That, that that's another thing that. Sorry, I, you, sorry, YouTube. Uh, there were issues with that election. Yeah, I think. By the way, and and, and you're, just so you know, you saying that he said that at the town hall, and it sounds like that's gonna be a one of the talking points over the next seventeen months. Well, this when people say get over it, don't talk about it. It's like that's what the left wants you to say. Do you, do you understand? They want you not to talk about I, the last election. I think election. the approach for me, Sebastian, would be to follow. Let me tell you what's one of my biggest concerns. When it uh-huh. comes down to election, yeah. specific to election, uh, I, I think election fraud has been going on for a long time. Yeah. And I think election fraud is something that they've gotten better and better and better at. Mm-hmm. But I also think election fraud, we can figure out a way to make it Oh, you, as you, close you, to you did this electronic thing. As yes, you mentioned. Yeah. I think I think well, I love it. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is the following: If he campaigns on that, I'm all for. I'm mm-hmm. going to be saying it off the top of my lungs. If it's hey, what if we can do the following? We have blockchain technology. We have this. We have that. Do you remember that one time he got up and he showed the PowerPoint, uh, uh, with the pictures that was being shown on a. Uh, 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 it was a regular conversation he was getting. You know, we showing bullet points. Here's what we're going to do with COVID. And then went to the next slide and the next slide and the next slide. What if they got up and he showed technology and says, look, here's what's available today for elections. Due to blockchain technology, 
This is what we can do to make sure all of your votes count. And quite frankly, some of you guys have a busy schedule. To the people on the left that don't have the time to go vote, guess what? No problem. To the people that are in the military, that are overseas, no problem. Here's what blockchain technology will do, and we have three different options of companies to use. If I get elected, what we're going to do is we're going to make this thing so easy and clear and honest that everybody knows your count. Your, your vote's going to get elected. We can see it. You can go look at it. Da, 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 da. I think that is a campaign message that's going to get people to say, I want honest and fair yeah. voting. I'm for it. Right. Rather than pulling the Hillary Clinton one of, well, let me tell you, you know, uh, you know, they uh, Russia, me. this. Yeah, right, I, I just right. I just don't think that's attractive to no, people I, that I, are capitalists and dependent doers. We, we, we I, I raise my kids to not be helpless. I raise my kids to be, we're going to go beat these guys no matter what. If they're doing this, get tougher, get stronger, right. get bigger. But if we expose them from this standpoint, then the left has to argue what? How unfair and racist it is to get people that don't have IDs. But wait a minute. I need an ID to buy this. So then they're going right. to lose that argument. That's all I, I'm saying. No, I like it. And it's very Trumpian to say we're going to fix it and here's technology. Right. That is, there's that a is Trumpian. There's a, there's a problem, though. It, it's not his job, right? The U.S. Constitution is clear. The states run elections. He can say the states should use blockchain and the state house should buy this. But the president has no power to do that. But you know what he can say? He can say the states that decide to use blockchain, we're going to give X, Y, Z to contribute and support with the technology and we're going to do this. I think that can be said. I like it. To me, that is similar messaging on what you're saying. So, hey, if you think there was fraud, here's what we can do. Here's a way to solve it. Boom. So, okay, so let's go back to uh, Casey DeSantis. I'm going to read a story. I just want to get your thoughts on this, if you have any opinions on it at all. So, uh, what page is it on? There it is. Okay. So, Casey and Ron DeSantis, okay, Uh, the greatest asset and his greatest liability. This is a political article that's written. uh, Let me go to page eight. Um, All right, here we go. The Casey DeSantis problem, his greatest asset and his greatest liability, political May 19. Casey DeSantis, wife of Ron DeSantis, significant figure in his political career and often seen as his greatest asset. She's charismatic, telegenic, and has a policy portfolio of her own. By the way, she's a beast in smaller setting. I couldn't even believe how powerful she was. Unlike Ron. Unbelievable how she was in a smaller setting. Yeah. However, some view Casey as both an important advisor and a political liability. She's heavily involved in decision-making, leading to a small inner circle around Ron, suggests she is hesitant to cede power and can be vindictive, leading to conflict with staff and strategic mistakes. Now, again, this could be a hit piece. They're going after her. The truth, who knows? The role of Casey DeSantis is a matter of concern and debate for many, with some believing she humanizes and enhances Ron's image, while others worry about her influence and the need for a more professional team around him. What are your thoughts about Casey? Well, First things first, uh, I, I, I'm kind of. I saw the rundown in, in the green room, and I saw this article was in there. I was a little bit uncomfortable because I think wives are, are um, you know, they're out of bounds. Uh, they came after my wife. She was a presidential appointee in the DHS, but she wasn't a public figure. When they came after her, the Daily Beast, all these scumbags at HuffPo. Uh, that, that that's the easiest way to piss me off. Um, if you're not a public figure, they're sacred. Your, your partner, your spouse is sacred. And the only interaction I've had with her, and I want to put this on the record because I haven't talked about it anywhere else, is when I found out about her cancer about a year ago on my show, we got like three and a half million listeners, and I'm, you know, I'm a Catholic, I believe. I said, would you just take a moment, dear friends, and just say a prayer for, for Casey and, and for the DeSantis family? And, and I, I did it because you know, I saw the news, and I thought, let's you know, use this power of prayer. About a month later, I get a a letter from the office of the First Lady of Florida, and it's her thanking me. I've never received anything. I mean, apart from the president sending me stuff, which is fine. He's my old boss. I've never received something from a public figure of that ilk to thank me for something I said on my show. Total respect. Respect. Utter respect. So so I'm not going to qualify her politically. I will say one thing. He does need somebody to humanize him because he he is not. You know, you've met him, right? The, The guy is not warm and fuzzy i mean he knows how to slam down the media and it's beautiful to watch but he's not a people person he's not a people person so uh i appreciate that Uh, and and my feeling about her is the same way however i have a big however for you i'll be the bad guy you can be the nice guy so and i haven't heard anything bad about her but who who wrote where was that piece this is political oh (laughs) but but it's but it's also coming from 
a uh, uh, few others as well. I mean, it's not it's not just that that's talking about them. Insider said a few things, which doesn't say much about Insider. But here's the part. For me, I, I come from a different angle. You ever seen the movie Air, the recent movie with uh, – you're not a basketball guy. So this movie, the story of Michael Jordan, how Nike landed him, et cetera, et cetera. There's a scene with Sonny Vicario that's preparing Michael Jordan for the fall to say, listen, yes, you're going to win championships. Yes, you're going to win MVP. Yes, you're going to do all this stuff. Great. But guess what? They're going to come after you. And for me, there's different types of wives, meaning uh, Ivania, uh, my saying uh, 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 Melania, Melania, is the kind of a wife, uh, first lady to me, that's kind of like, listen, I support you. I'll go do the shaking hands, all this stuff, but I'm not going to be Michelle Obama. <laughs> it's you. Make sense? Like, yeah. this is your job. Yeah. I got Baron as my job, right. and I'm going to be this, but do not get me involved. And guess what? I view President Donald Trump saying, you're totally fine, babe. Do what you got to do. I got this. That's kind of how I view that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, Barack, uh, if you bring Michelle in and Michelle's also throwing punches, you got to. If we get into a fight, let's just say me and my wife, a woman comes and a husband and wife are fighting us. <laughs> if he's swinging and if my wife swings her at her, she swings back, I'm not going to be surprised. That's what her job is. Let's just say. Mm -hmm. But if my wife is like, listen, let's just step aside. Let's have our husbands kind of do their thing. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I see. But Casey is a also a fighter. So but, it, is she, but is she doing that fighting publicly like Michelle? I, I don't think. No, 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 no. I don't see her as Michelle no. at all. I don't see her as Michelle. But I think she's part of the campaign. The whole thing. Casey and Ron DeSantis have such a close partnership. They've morphed into a singular entity. People call the DeSantis, mm -hmm. right? Not the DeSantis political. There's a part of this that if you play to this card... I do believe they have to be ready that people are going to come after her because she is one of the. Oh tools no, they have they have using. to be ready. They have to yeah, be ready. Have yeah. to be ready. So I just want to make yeah. sure it's not going to be like, hey, it's no, no. unfair what they're doing. No, no, expect the darkest of the ways to approach you. Yeah, and to me, uh, uh, if the approach is kind of like it's unfair what they're doing. It's got to be more totally get it. If we're choosing to have the highest job in office in America, this comes with the territory. Right. We're totally okay with that. Right. That to me is a little bit more of a you know respect. But I got to tell you, I've been in a lot of small group settings, and I've seen a lot of wives that are super power, like couple power, uh, couple power. She is very, very solid. And what I mean by solid, charisma, charm, likability, incredible communicator, smart, intelligent, true believer, mannerisms, respecting husband, edifying him, getting out of the way, not the shadow, doesn't need the limelight, doesn't even take the you know, the shots that Michelle would take at Obama. I don't know if you know what shots I'm talking about. Sometimes she kind of undermines him. Zero. All of that, she's a, she's a dime in the way of a first lady. So I think that is going to be a big part for him. You made a comment to her when you said you kind of got to be out there more. I don't know how much of a role she's going to be playing. I think if she does play a role, um, she's a she's a very strong uh, uh, she's a very strong uh, uh, a strength of his mm -hmm. if it's used. We're going to see what's going to happen. I'll just add one thing. Uh, when we did have a brief conversation, I w I told her to her face. I said I was very impressed with how you handled yourself, and she was almost like, "You think so? You, you think I should talk this much?" I was like, "Keep doing what you're doing." It was very Super impressive. very yeah. impressive. Super impressive. Maybe she should be out there more. I I think so. <laughs> I and I, by the way, I one million percent think so. Again, I have no clue who is their marketing manager, Some or CMO, idiot. Or temp. Oh my god! The, the, Whoever his, it is. his influences on Twitter. I know these guys. These were friends yeah. of mine. They are just so unprofessional. It's shocking. Well, he's about to join the big leagues right now. Well, he's I mean, try right. Well. Yeah. Uh, correct. He's going right. to be announcing, right. and I think I, I'm sort of half joking, but I'm actually being honest. I think he needs to hire like <laughs> the queer eye for the straight guys makeover team, and and realize we are now right. going against yeah. whether you like him or not. Maybe one Mondini. of the bros, one That's of the a most great market. <laughs> Can you imagine? Ron DeSantis <laughs> announces his marketing manager, Dylan Mulvaney, zero for him to become the most relevant person on zero social media. Zero chance of that. Yeah, but or else? the Bud Lights uh, uh, VP of marketing. She's she looking could be for somebody, a job, right? But he is going against, whether you like him or not, one of the most brilliant marketers yeah, totally. ever with Donald Trump. Totally. And whether it's he, – he can do the policy thing all day long. That's not going to move he's the needle. He's the GOAT, though. He needs to he's the goat of marketing. learn the marketing strategy. Yeah, he, he's, he's the GOAT there's, of there's marketing. There's nobody better. No. There's nobody better. He's the GOAT of marketing. We still We're, talk about those nicknames. We still talk yeah. about Little Marco. We still talk about, you know, Crooked Hillary. We still talk about them yeah. seven years later.
He is the ultimate. <laughs> Ted Cruz is right. Uh, right. Yeah, the roast. Ted Cruz's wife is still very ugly in the face. By, by the way, uh, uh, Epstein. Are you following the story with Gates at all? Or I no? am. I'm like not interested. I mean, this yeah. this whole G- Gates is like a nerd with too much money, and maybe he ran around with uh, you know girls that were too young. It's like seriously, uh, I want to see the list. I want to see the list. I don't Do care you, about. But I want to see the John's list. Okay, so here's okay. the question: Do you think that is? I asked this question on Twitter the other day. If you want to pull this up, I did a poll. And I said, which of these four things would you want the 2024 candidate to talk about? I don't know if you saw this or not. The four issues. And then I said, I, I saw your thing about a Biden economy versus Trump economy. That, <laughs> that was as a sexist. I like that. That was good. <laughs> as a sexist. Credit goes to our guy from uh, 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 Raul. Anyways, p- put this up there. Zoom in a little bit. Wow. So, OK, so exactly. So which issues matter to you the most in 2020? And I said, post that's, any other issues below. That's interesting. Investigate. the. It's 20,000 votes. Investigate the yeah. Wuhan lab. Lowest. But like Ukraine is big. Like Ukraine that. and and by the wow. way, that's a big part of his play. Wow. Thirty nine percent border no, immigration, thirty three percent. And nobody can can do what he does. On no, because when he I, says it'll end in twenty four hours, it will. I agree. And nobody else I can totally say that. Agree. Nobody can say I that. I totally agree. But the Epstein list. Do you, yeah. do you think that is something that people are interested in? Do you think that's a that's well, enough look, of a look. list for camp, for somebody to campaign behind or not really? I think these are your followers, right? These are these are your listeners, right? These are people who are yeah. interested. Um, I don't I don't think that is. Look, you have to understand. Everybody in this room is a freak, right? Because we're into politics. Most Americans are not into politics. They they want to make the car payment at the end of the month and make sure the kid has a new pair of sneakers for for the new t- semester, right? Um, Epstein for most Americans, like who, what? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's important because we need to know who went to that island. We need to know. I don't think it's a campaign issue. It's going to be the board. Look, who said it? It's the economy, stupid. It's going to be the economy and the border. And those two things are... James Carville. Yeah, right. Clinton. Right. Clinton, uh, Bush. um, Yeah, but that's... The the Russia thing is fascinating. 38.8%. Interesting. It's not even... I mean, it's not even a close thing with the top two. No, no, no. And people, how quickly they're over COVID. I am shell-shocked that Investigate Wuhan Lab is not higher. But How is by that the, possible? And assume our audience, like assume even, I thought our exactly. audience would have been higher than 7.6%. But even our audience is saying, nah, listen, man, I'm over it. We got bigger things to do. It just shows two years later, boom, done with that. How Let's go. What's going America on America moves on. How quickly America moves on. At this pace, we're going to be wearing uh, uh, Kanye West uh, Yee's shoes, uh, uh, what, a year from now with the <laughs> It's coming it. soon, guys. <laughs> I'm not 2024, sure about that. President Trump's going to walk up to it. Maybe DeSantis will. To speak to that. If, you know, we're looking forward, not backwards, doesn't that give sort of uh, testimony to stop doing the election denial thing because people are over it? Isn't that a case right there? I, think I don't know. Partially. But, but I'm telling you, for me, I made a video 11 years ago, 10 years ago on how I would change voting. I'm going to text it to you for you to watch. It's, an, it's not a private video. It's not a public video. How to change the voting system, right? To me... I don't like our system on the way we vote. I don't trust it. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't even like the way it's set up for for the uh, structure of it. So I think that is something I would be talking about if I'm campaigning, but I'm not. I'm just a guy that's running businesses. Complete different ballgame we're playing here. Have you seen Kill Chain? Kill Chain? The documentary Kill Chain? I have not. You need to watch Kill Chain. Kill Chain was made by the Democrats before the 2016 election and it's got senator warren and all these people and it is an hour and a half on how you can hack our elections and how the biggest threat to america is hacked elections you can't find it's very hard to find now watch kill chain kill chain they go to ebay they buy a dominion computer yeah. they take it to a cyber hacking conference within 30 minutes the machine is hacked i mean th- this you're, you're allowed to talk about it until a certain point when you're not allowed to talk about it but what you said earlier is correct they've been doing this for 60 years. I mean, think about it. We're in America, the only nation in, on, on the yeah. planet that put men on the moon six times. And we make jokes about Philadelphia, Chicago, and Baltimore stealing elections. We, we make jokes about it. Yeah. You don't need, you know, high tech to do this if you've been doing it for 60 years. But it is a problem that needs to be fixed. The idea that India can have voter ID, India, more than a billion people, Mexico, with a civil war, with an insurgency, with the cartels, has voter ID, and we don't... That's insane. By the way, what you just did right there, I would have somebody on his team 
create a 10-slide PowerPoint mm -hmm. the next time he's speaking. And you know how he goes through a speech? And just show this. Did you know right. India has voter ID? Did you know? Because American people are going to say, wait, Mexico's <laughs> more advanced than us. Right. India's more advanced. How come we don't have this? Right. We should have this as well. That's what gets people thinking. Now, next story I want to get into is about what NAACP just announced. I don't know if you saw that yes. or not. The travel ban? Yes. Yeah. Hate-inspired leadership. Wow. NAACP joins other, other groups in warning against travel to Florida. This is a Miami Herald story from yesterday. The oldest civil group. Civil rights group in the U.S. has issued a travel advisory urging travelers to reconsider visiting Florida due to the state's openly hostile leadership, significantly, specifically citing Governor Ron DeSantis' attempts to ban books about race and LGBTQ identities and his opposition to diversity and inclusion programs in colleges. NAACP Derek Johnson, president, argues that the refusal to teach an accurate representation of, of the challenges faced by African Americans is a disservice to students and a neglect of duty. Other civil rights organizations such as LULAC and Equality Florida have also issued travel warnings for Florida, citing concerns over DeSantis' crackdown on immigration and the potential risks to health, safety, and freedom. However, tourism in Florida remains strong with record numbers of visitors, and local leaders emphasize their city's commitment to diversity and inclusion. By the way, I wouldn't even be surprised if the NAACP isn't staying at uh, Miami for uh, uh, summertime. Oh, that, no, no, that chairwoman, yeah. Jesse Waters did a thing on his show last night. Yeah. That chairwoman just posted from Twitter her holiday, her vacation in Florida. The <laughs> NAACP <laughs> Exactly. Chairwoman. You see, <laughs> right? these are politically motivated Totally. Um, this is about boycotts. Ron. This is about you know, Ron. No, this is a political boycott that has no teeth whatsoever. Budweiser mm -hmm. is down, by, by some estimates, 28% thanks to the Bud Light boycott, which has been very effective and very welcomed by Coors and competitors on one hand. On the other hand, you look at the diversity in Florida, you look at diversity at the uh, beaches, someone didn't get the memo that you were supposed to boycott and maybe go to some other place. Well, how about and Chicago? And it has no teeth in it. How about Chicago? Well, why, why don't we boycott, you know, Chicago? You, 22 people shot last weekend, and I can guarantee you that most of those are black Americans. So why aren't we boycotting Chicago or Baltimore? The, the average weekend on Chicago is 10 people killed and 50 shot. The average weekend. But the NAACP, straight Black Lives Matter, doesn't care about the people being killed in Chicago. It's just hypocrisy. Yeah, I don't think this travel ban is doing anything or this travel warning is doing anything to mitigate people from tra traveling no. to Florida. Whether it's the Panhandle, whether they're going to Disney World in Orlando, whether they're coming to South Beach in Miami, people are coming. Nobody's like, you know that vacation we've been working on for the last two months for the summer? Let's go. Yeah, there's the NAACP made this warning. about. They're like, dude, we're going to party. Stop it. Yeah, you say that, but I literally had a guest that's scheduled for your podcast that sent an email yesterday. Hey, bro, I want to confirm it's safe for me and my family to travel <laughs> there still. I'm seeing this over the internet and news. I'm coming with my girlfriend and our two sons. Is it safe or should we reschedule? That's, that's a joke. And then they included an Instagram post to the NAACP Can you do article. me a favor and don't say the name. Can you text yeah. me the name who it is, by the way? Yes. Can you text me? And meanwhile, show yeah. the show the meme I just sent you. Guy sent me this. I thought it was That's wild. something very interesting uh, 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 to think about. Tulsi's text him right now. But can you can you post this real quick? Uh, 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 which which makes you think. And by the way, whether you like this meme or not, there is a lot of truth behind this meme. Uh, here's what the meme is, Tom. I don't know if you've seen this one. Uh, take a look at this, Adam. What's Tulsi texting? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, white, yes, yes. White yes, asylum, yes, yes, yes. white victim, nobody cares. Black asylum, black victim, nobody cares. Black asylum, white victim, nobody cares. White asylum, black victim, people lose their minds. There's your news, there's your mainstream media mm -hmm. uh, narrative. That's the narrative that that's, they will support. That's Neely. That's, that's the filter for the stories, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, but this, this is what makes, and by the way, uh, didn't they just have a, a 25,000 Haitians had an event here, happy, doing an event in Florida, right? You look at the crime on what's going on. You look at how many people are moving here to Florida. Statistically, that argument loses a lot of weight when they say you got to be careful moving to Florida. I love it how people can say things like that, but data argues completely the other way than you do. This is what happened with Newsom. Newsom talked about how terrible Florida is. More people. The more he talks shit about Florida, the more people from California wanted to move to Florida. Mm -hmm. And it's not slowing down. And by the way, this is due to a great governor.
a guy named Ron DeSantis. Right. Thanks to Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking Freaking Newsom. <laughs> Newsom, the green governor with uh, half a barrel of oil in his hair. Yes. <laughs> hey, let's let's talk about this. Uh, 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 let's talk about this other story. I'm trying to see which one to go through. Ah, let's go through this one. Your page 15. Uh, a meeting. I don't know if you were invited to this meeting or not. Your accent says yes, but your value <laughs> says no. A secretive <laughs> annual meeting attended by the world's elite has AI top of the agenda. CNBC story. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman joins tech leaders and political heavyweights at the selective annual Bilderberg meeting in Lisbon, Portugal. They're, they're, they're public about it now. It's uh -oh, no longer private. It's the builders. Yeah. Uh, the meeting's agenda places a strong emphasis on artificial intelligence and includes a discussion on topics such as the banking system, China energy uh, transition, Europe fiscal challenges, India industrial pol policy and trade, NATO, Russia, transitional uh, threats, Ukraine, and U.S. leadership. The three-day event attended by approximately 130 uh, participants from 23 different countries, maintains which prevented disclosure of speakers, uh, uh, identities, and affiliations. The clandestine nature of the meeting has given rise to conspiracy theories, uh, but or organizers state that it facilitates open and unrestricted discussions. The Bilderberg meeting, established in 1954, aims to promote dialogue between Europe and North America. Attendees participate as individuals rather than in official capacity. Uh, when a meeting like this happened, what do you think about this? Is there anything behind it? Is it uh, the conspiracy theories? Do they have anything right about this? Or is it just guys coming together together to talk about the future threats? Look, I, I love conspiracy theories. I'm actually launching a new TV show that's expressly about them, but I like them as entertainment. There's a reason they're called theories and not conspiracy facts. Uh, they've been. Is this news? that rich people who are powerful hang out with each other and think they can run the world. No. I mean, go back to Bretton Woods. Go, go, go back in time to any elite that has power, that has money. They think that they can shape the future. The Rothschilds, Bohemian Grove, San Francisco. On and on and on, on and on. Medici. This, this, yeah, this isn't new. Uh, back to Machiavelli, the prince, you, you, you name it. When it comes to AI, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a wonk, okay? Uh, I'm not a geek. I just don't buy this, you know, Skynet is across the horizon. We're about to be. You know, the, the, the idea that we can't just pull the plug at some point on this stuff when it gets too scary. Terminator yeah. reference, very good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the idea that it helps you write your college essays. Okay, that's really exciting. I mean, okay. But the idea that this is some threat to humanity, I'm open to uh, hear people who are building this stuff tell me, yes, this is the greatest threat to humanity. But uh, while we've got 6 million people crossing the border illegally, 110,000 people dying from fentanyl, China remilitarizing, Russia with nuclear weapons invading other people's countries, you know, I'm not going to get too excited about this stuff. Tom. Well, I, I think this has been going on for a long time. And, you know, you go back to Rothschilds and the banking. And, uh, you know, I, I think that when groups of people like this get together, it draws a lot of fire and a lot of there's a lot of magnetism to what's going on there. Uh, and, and I think what's what's also going on is you've got the purveyors of AI trying to get the political elite to calm down about AI. You have to remember what's going on here. There's a lot of money to be made in these in these companies and a lot of investment it's billions of dollars have already been invested in ai so you have sam altman open ai ceo and and um y combinator fame incubator you know saying easy does it easy does it yeah there could be some things here but easy does it meanwhile what they don't want you, this is a classic thing where I, I think the purveyors of AI, the inventors, and those operating companies and investments really don't want the governments to come in and regulate it. I think this is – this is. You Let can, me ask the question in a different way. So either one of you guys, if you got an invitation to go to the Builder, uh, uh, to, Bilderberg. To go, Bilderberg meeting, would you go to it if it's not a big deal? I hate these people. Why would I go? Okay. So you have no desire to go to Zero. it. Zero. But they want to get your perspective, your point of view. I don't care. I don't care. The, the, these people – What kind of a people, diplomat are you? I'm you not a diplomat. You know what the only other job – what? There's three jobs I do in the next administration. What's that? I do national security advisor. I'd run personnel. You know, the only third one for shits and grins. What's that? I'd be ambassador to the UN. So I could walk in there and the whole building would catch a, a, a flame. That's it. Diplomacy? No. Forget about it. This is America. It's about leadership. It's about being the greatest nation on God's green earth. These people hate 
the people. So the people that are tenders, they hate the you people. think they hate the people of and they hate them. Of course they do. Of course they hate the people. They chose the wrong person in, in, in 2016. They chose the wrong box when the Brexit vote. They chose the wrong person in Hungary. They hate the choice of the people. Why, why is populism a dirty word? Think about that for a second. Populism is a dirty word. Uh, excuse me? It, the thing you're doing is popular with the most people? That tells you everything you need to know. When the left made populism a pejorative, you realize what they think of the average person. I traveled with President Trump on Air Force One to Youngstown, Ohio. Now, Youngstown is deep rust belt, okay? We got off Air Force One at a military base. No press, no nothing. He got into the beast. We had about a 20-minute ride to the stadium, okay? On the left-hand side, all we saw was shuttered, closed steel mill, you know, broken glass, broken windows. On, on the other side of the road, people modestly dressed with their children on the side of the road, waving a little stars and stripes. We get to the stadium. The boss is in the back with the VIPs. I decide to go into the pit, take selfies with people. I realized that these are all Democrats. Their dads were Democrats. Their grandparents worked in the mill. When he came out on stage with Melania, he couldn't give a speech for minutes because they were screaming, USA, USA, USA. Those are the people the Bilderbergers hate. The people who built America by the sweat of their brow. I have no interest hanging out with those people. Got it. I was going to say they, they were telling us there's an invitation for you. But <laughs> go, you go. I'll, 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 I have I'll no do interest. The, I'll, I'll, I was trying to get you I'll into do the that helicopter meeting. They said they have no interest for you. I'll do the helicopter Now you're rights. saying that. Now Listen, I, so you just heard his answer. The answer is no. And I'll, ca I'll counter that, Sebastian. I agree with you and about... 94.625% of what you just said I agree with. Traitor. Very specific numbers. Just, yep. But I would go. You, I would go. And if they're going to invite the Trojan horse to their confab, mm -hmm. I'm going. Would you touch the Trojan horse? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Do it, Tom. Touch it. Touch it. Okay. Ukraine, Russia. You, yes. you briefed a, a lot of 05s, 06s, and 1 stars. Um this is a question from a lot of different people right. that get asked, and you hear the answer. How can you not see what Russia is doing? How can you not see what Ukraine is doing? How can you not see the fact that there's ties between Biden and Ukraine? Do you not remember what he said publicly? If you don't do this, and then I'll do this. How can you not see all this stuff? And then, hey, F-16, yeah, maybe we'll let him train. And then if somebody else gives him, we're not going to get in the way. Are you saying you're not going to give him F-16s? We may. We don't know. <laughs> right now, I can't answer that. So what is your thoughts on what's going on over there? Uh, I wrote a piece on my Substack as soon as the war came out. You can check it. I haven't changed my opinion then. I remember the good old days when conservatives hated KGB colonels and thought Russia invading other countries was bad. I remember those days. The idea today that, oh, he's a champion of the West and he's a Christian. You mean the same guy who persecuted Christians when he was a uniform-wearing member of the KGB? What about the biolabs? Oh, who built the biolabs? The Soviet Union built the biolabs. That's interesting. And then the question that, well, we shouldn't help them because Ukraine's corrupt. Huh. That's the dumbest one. Is DC corrupt? Do you think Biden's corrupt? If you do, does that mean China can just invade and roll their tanks down Pennsylvania Avenue? This is wrong. The simplest way to understand it, corruption up the Yazoo or not, is this. This man is a bully. He's a bully who said for 20 years, since he became president, he's been giving lectures how Ukraine, how Poland, how the Baltic states are illegitimate, have no right to exist as independent states. Go back to school. Go, go back to when you're a 10-year-old. What happens to the bully if he doesn't get challenged? What happens? He keeps on bullying. When does he stop bullying? When you give the bastard a bloody nose. We're helping the Ukrainians give this guy a bloody nose. And to the last thing about this Tucker Carlson kind of who cares about the world, pull down the shutters on the Pacific and the Atlantic, screw them all. If 1776 means something to you as an American, let me remind you that without the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish, this would still be part of the British Empire period, end of story. If the French hadn't blockaded the British, if the Dutch and the Spanish hadn't bankrolled Washington, meaning General Washington, we never would have won. 
This is their 1776. So if it means something to you, if our revolutionary war means something, us helping other people fight their 1776, uh, it should mean something to you as well. So uh, uh, no apologies to people I've pissed off. Ukraine has a right to be independent. The Kremlin are a bunch of bastards, uh, and we should help them fight for themselves. Not deploy the 82nd Airborne. I'm not interested in dumb wars and us fighting other people's wars. They should fight their wars, and we should help them. End of story. How well, much you, heat do you catch from having oh, this opinion? I mean, this man uh, alive. You're born in Hungary. You understand Soviet communism. You understand Russia relations. I, I go on Bannon's show every week. This is not popular with with the the war room hobbits and even with Steve. But now, if you if you're in the Trump administration and you and you bring this opinion into the White House, what do you think uh, he'll say to that? Oh, he no, he gets it. I mean, look, President Trump. Let's be very clear about what President Trump is. He's not an interventionist, but he's not a Tucker, Tucker and uh, isolationist. Be very clear what he did. The guy who is accused today of being a Russian asset. Do you know what we did when we found 300 Russians running around Syria? Wagner Group guys working for the Kremlin. You know what we did? He called up Mattis and he said, turn them into red mist now. Kill them all. We killed 300 Russian soldiers in Syria. No president since the revolution of 1917 has killed hundreds of Russians in wartime. We did, okay? He's not an isolationist. What happened in Syria when we saw the chemical... I, this is declassified now. I can talk about it. What happened when we saw the chemical weapons being pulled out of that air base again to be used against civilians? Over chocolate cake at Mar-a-Lago, with Xi Jinping eating his chocolate cake, pre the president le leant over and said, <clears throat> uh, I just launched 52 uh, cruise missiles on that Syrian air base. He's not interested in dumb wars. He's not interested in fighting other people's wars. But when you cross a line... We will make you extra crispy. That's President Trump. Strength through leadership, peace through strength. That is, look, one of the most powerful moments for me in the White House is I went into the Oval. It was just me and the president. And I was there to brief him on Iran, I think. And he's very sidetracked. He's sitting sideways to the Resolute desk. He's reading some documents. And out of nowhere, because I'm there to talk about the Iran deal and killing it, and he says... He looks up and he says, Sebastian, I do not. It was uh, some, Kim had just done something. Sebastian, I do not want to have American GIs die on the Korean Peninsula again. I mean, he, would just, he just went so heavy, so fast. But if we have to go to war, we will. That's who he is. I don't want to, but only if it matters to our national security. That's why people don't understand who he is. You said Trump would mm -hmm. end the war, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Twenty-four. How will he do that? Uh, because because Putin's afraid of him. Think think about what happened after we killed three hundred Russians working for the Kremlin in Syria. Putin didn't even have a press conference. You think didn't Putin, even have a press conference. You think Putin is afraid of totally, Trump? Totally, utterly. Why is he afraid of Trump? Because he doesn't know what Trump's going to do to him. I'll give you an idea. Uh, CNN just announced that they put 500, Putin put 500 people on the a list that you can't visit uh, uh, Russia. I don't know if you saw that or not. Who's on the list? If you can pull this up, 500 names. Uh, Obama's on the list. John Huntsman's on the list. You remember the foreign... Uh, uh, ambassador. He, yes, ambassador. Yeah. He's on the list. Kimmel's on the list. Kimmel? Uh, Colbert's on the list. Uh, a bunch of guys are on the list. But uh, Trump's not on the list, so, you know, who knows what this means. But this just <laughs> came out a few days ago. Yeah, yeah Obama is on the list. Obama cannot visit Russia, but Trump can. Obama, Colbert, among 500 Americans, banned from going to Russia. This just came out a couple days ago. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's the name. So l l let me wrap up with this story, and then i got a surprise for you. I think you're going to like our new thumbnail. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to like it if he's None fired. of you guys have seen it. I'm about to give it to you to show it. I think this is legit, and it's the truth. What we're about to do, I, I did this while we were talking. I, you've been I had busy. Our entire, you've been I had our entire been team working. working on this thumbnail. My and the helicopter will be here right like after it. the so show. Biden gets low rating on econ economy, guns, immigration, and uh, AP uh, Nork poll, uh, AP News poll, only 33% of American adults approve of President Biden's handling of the economy, while just 24% believe the national economic conditions are in good shape. Furthermore, only 31% approve of Biden's performance on gun policy and immigration issues. Among Demo Democrats, the approval rating the higher, but still not overwhelming, with approximately 61% appro approving of Biden's handling of the economy, 75% approving of his overall job performance. However, Democrats are more pessimistic about the current state of the economy. 
Only 41% dissatisfaction with Biden's performance extends beyond party lines, as even some of his supporters express frustration with the post-pandemic situation and a lack of bipartisanship in Washington. They're now saying it's the lowest approval rating ever yeah. in America. Uh, if that's the case, one, are the Dems going to let him really run? Are they going to get creative the next 17 months? Because if he does run, this is not. This is going to be very easy. Like you said, the one line. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? That's the only question I got to ask. Right. So is this re- is he really going to be the candidate? Well, look, I just want to know who the thirty one percent is. Who, who are the thirty one percent in America? The who people approve, that don't follow politics. Who, yeah, who appro- but approve approve yeah. of Biden's performance? Um, you know, it's not good for a, a former strategist to the president to, to admit this. I, I don't have an answer to that question. I ask this question every single day of my producer. How can they let this guy run? I mean, you look at him, just the last two years, just the mental and physical deterioration, him stumbling around Japan, him, you know, greeting dead people. How do you <laughs> let this person run? And the only answer I have for you is there's really no mechanism for an incumbent president to be removed by his own party. The, the DNC can't have a vote and say, you're not allowed to run again. The power of the incumbency is almost total. However, there is that very peculiar interview he gave once where he said, he was asked, what, what happens, this is when, when, when Obama came in, he said, what happens if there's a disagreement between you and Obama on policy? Do you remember this? It was creepy. He said, I, I don't think we'll have a disagreement, but, but if we do, I'll come up with an, quote, I'll come up with an ailment and I'll retire. Come up with an ailment? <laughs> What the hell is that? So is he, are they going to show him the video and say, hey, Joe, it's time for, you're the president now, but it's time for you to come up with an ailment. And then it's the cackler. Then it's Kamala. And uh, it's going to be even more fun. Then the debate's going to be. You think it should be required to take a mental and physical test open to the public to to be disclosed? No. I don't think you should have to do that? No, I don't. I don't. Why? Because it's, it's the will of the people. I'm the convinced people Trump wants Biden. I'm, I'm oh, convinced Trump wants Biden. I'm I, I, convinced me too. he's hoping. He's I standing. want you, Rocky Three. Because that's a, it's not it's not even a Rocky fight though. Because I don't think he's this is not he's not going against clever he, Lang or he's not going against a power. He, he wants retribution. No, yeah, he and it's it's an easy matchup for him because all he has to do is talk resume. That's all he has to do. Okay, couldn't, couldn't one argue that? And the single biggest Biden indicator of Trump elect- over DeSantis. Biden would want Trump over. Like meaning, things. if the, if that if they're Could doing be. their strategy yeah. meeting, and Biden is saying, "All right, who would you rather, Trump one or of them. I think he's screwed with either one of them. I think he's screwed with either one of them. It's just about who America wants more. I don't think he's in good shape with either one of them. So, your latest book, "The War for America's Soul." Uh, 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 if we can put the link below for the book. The War for America's Soul, as well as the link to his. Go to my store, sebgorkastore.com, for the FBI t-shirts, for the free Tucker t-shirts. Check them out. Oh, you've got the FBI t-shirt there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sebgorkastore.com. It's our hottest selling item until Tucker came along. Oh, and the transgender t-shirt that my guy said would not sell. It is the number number two t-shirt. There you go, that one. Don't don't be a science denier. They said that wouldn't sell. That's a number two. A man is a man, a woman is a woman. (laughs) Don't be a science science denier. denier. And and last but not least, to make up the 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 it's better be good. our our marketing guys have been working on this for the last two hours, <laughs> hoping the new thumbnail is better. Rob, drum roll, show us what we got. Bam! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Who is that? Is that Sly? That's the truth. Who is that? That is the truth. The one and only. But you could so, you could have got a better one of you. Listen, I lo- the, listen. the idea is to make you look good, not oh, make you look good. Yeah. You're the show. I'm just the host. I lost man. 42 pounds, look BBD. Uh, look at me uh, now. Watch. You know what's going to happen? Mainstream right. media is going to say that's a f- uh, that's fake news. No. But that's the truth. But I thought it's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth, the truth right there. The muscles behind us, Sebastian. It's been a blast having you on. Thanks, buddy. Uh, uh, people uh, uh, can listen to you talk for hours. Uh, not only from the voice standpoint, but also from the standpoint of how you break things down. Uh, looking forward to doing this again with you here Anytime. soon, next 18 months, especially during this election run. Gang, uh, we're about to announce the next live. Text us the following. This is what I want from you. The next live we're going to do at our lounge slash cigar lounge. Do you want it to be home team? Do you want us to have a guest? If yes, who do you want to have? Text the word podcast to 310-340-1132. The word podcast to 310-340-1132. First, text the word podcast. 
then let us know what format you would prefer. Having said that, be sure to order the book below and subscribe to his website, to his Substack. Uh, I believe we're doing it again tomorrow, or am I out of town tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. What tomorrow, tomorrow? tomorrow I mean, at 9 a.m., uh, Rob Smith from Turning Point USA. Oh, to home team, we're going to do with yep. Rob Smith tomorrow, and I'm going to be in New York tomorrow night. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.